Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Tonight's show host Jimmy Fallon clowns around with celebrities five nights a week, entertaining his audience and himself. Mo Rocca learned how he stays so enthusiastic about the job. You've been accused of acting like you like everything. How do you answer this grave charge? I want everything to work. And I know people come on my show, they're selling something. I have to sell their thing. And I know how much work goes into it. And you do a movie and it's four months of shooting and then two months of selling it. So it's like half a year of your life. I want it to be a hit. Later in the show, Jimmy Fallon contemplates the afterlife. So it's this is probably a hard question for you to answer, but or not. Um, the hosts that come after you, I mean, wow. why is it that? Wow. Why do you I didn't think, think we were going to get that. <laughs> It's Sunday morning. I know. Well, it's Sunday morning. You, you want to hear the horn. You want to be happy. You're in a Zen moment. You're talking about my afterlife. Well, I, it, 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 when you're when you're happily in retirement, oh, so I mean, I'm still it's, alive. Yeah, you're still you're definitely in this scenario. You're still yeah, alive. Describe my death. Please. You're still you're you're absolutely alive, and you're you're really enjoying. You and Nancy are, you know, it could be like a yeah. Cialis commercial. The setting. In terms <laughs> We're of holding like, hands in separate bathtubs. Then Lee Cowan takes a closer look at the cultural impact of Peanuts comics and the man behind them at the Charles Schultz Museum in California. I got a hit! I got a hit! I finally got a hit! I mean, think of the comics before then. They were all slapstick. People getting hit over the head or pies. This was something saying, hey, I'm not happy. I wonder if you're not happy. I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling anxious. I'm heartbroken. Peanuts had all of that. That's all coming up right here. On Here Comes the Sun. Don't let Jimmy Fallon's role as the silly MC of The Tonight Show fool you. He takes it very seriously. In a characteristically upbeat interview, he told our Mo Rocca how his upbringing influenced the comedian he is today. I just say, like, look at this. You can hold it. You can right. open it. You can read it like a book. You can see photos of what the pictures they look like. And it's not yeah, an act. Here, you can use this thing if you want. <laughs> it's when it's a lorgnette. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon really loves music. Oh, I got some good stuff. Dude, Annie, get your gun with Doris Day. So much so, he's got a whole room in his house dedicated to his vinyl collection. All right, check this out. This will be good. It's here where he dutifully dusts his LPs. There's definitely fingerprints on here. This looks like there's peanut butter and jelly on this one. Cleans his needle. And you tap the needle onto the jelly thing. I tell you about my baby. Sometimes he'll make his own music here. Does she come around? About a five feet four. From the head to the ground. This was from my high school collection. I love this. And if the mood oh. strikes... Let's hear downtown. This is so good. <gasps> that sound, yes. All hell breaks loose. That love of music is evident on The Tonight Show. Which he's hosted for nine seasons. Jamming alongside pop music's biggest names. And now on his musical game show, That's My Jam, where artists like Kelly Clarkson and Ariana Grande have a little fun while reminding us what makes them superstars. <laughs> Kelly and Ariana can really sing, and they were like going for it. When Kelly is singing Whitney Houston, the place is melting. Like, they almost don't even need microphones. Yeah. It's amazing when you get to see that type of talent on the show. Fallon describes himself as the most overly entertained human on the planet, as much a fan as a host. It shows. I saw Kim Kardashian post these ear puzzles that yeah. they were organic eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's just telling eggs. Like... We sat down with him at Electric Lady Studios in Manhattan. You've been accused of acting like you like everything. How do you answer this grave charge? I want everything to work. And I know people come on my show, they're selling something. I have to sell their thing. 
and I know how much work goes into it. And you do a movie and it's four months of shooting and then two months of selling it. So it's like half a year of your life. I want it to be a hit. So I always root for everything. The cheerleader in Jimmy Fallon may be a legacy of his mother, Gloria, whom he describes as his biggest booster. My mom passed away five years ago now, but it's interesting to find all the clippings of every single thing. I was in any newspaper, any TV guide, any mention of me, my mom would cut it out and keep it. Like she would call me and be like, you're on Ellen or whatever. I go, yeah, I know, I'm, <laughs> I'm me, of course. You're telling me I'm on, I'm, yes, of course, I didn't know I'm on, but she would tell, remind me that I'm on, you know? Fallon has almost always worked clean. That may have something to do with how he was raised. In a middle-class household in Socrates, New York, the cast included mom and dad, Jim Fallon Sr., and Jimmy and his big sister, also named Gloria. Were your parents strict? My parents were very, very strict. Uh, wow. Irish Catholic, no dirty words, no s sexy anything. We used to videotape Friday night videos. And my dad would watch them the next day on the weekend and actually like splice and like go VCR to VCR just to give us the videos we were allowed to watch. So he was editing <laughs> he was these like shows to say, yeah. to, to do a kid-friendly version. I had a Rodney Dangerfield album, No Respect, and my dad used a car key to scrape out any dirty words in the album. So I used to listen to Rodney Dangerfield and totally missed the punchline. And I thought that was funny. I was like, he's like, oh, I'll tell you, my wife, you know, she, and then people are clapping. You go, yeah, that's a good joke. I missed the whole joke because they yeah. cut everything. He scratched it out with the key. Do you think that that was a good thing or a bad thing when you look back at it? I think it's a little crazy, uh, you know, but also, I don't know. It didn't seem to affect me that much. I mean, I never, ever really worked dirty, you know. I've done it a couple times, you know, and I remember my grandpa took me to a gig once and I said the F word and it just felt so weird. And the drive home was very quiet. Really? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm sorry, yeah, I did that. It wasn't even, I didn't even get a laugh. There were rules, but the family also knew how to have a good time. They would do a duet, my mom and dad. They would lip sync, but also sing over You Don't Bring Me Flowers. It used to be so natural. Barbara Streisand Barbara, and, and Neil Diamond. Diamond yeah. And at the end, we had these fake flowers in our living room. And my sister and I, we would throw the roses at them and they would bow and stuff. It was and ridiculous. And you just doing this as kids. For no one, yeah, for just us, yeah. These family dynamics, it really does sound like you're describing a bit that would be on your show. But this, it was normal, like, for us. We would do it numerous times. We, that would be a bit. Like, we would say, like, are you gonna do the You Don't Bring Me Flowers bit? Let's do that again, that's good. And that's, that's our, we all have our bits that we would do. Fallon has his own family now. He married producer Nancy Javonin in 2007. They have two daughters. How long would you like to see him in this job? To me, this is a lifelong job because of this. I think... <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, I didn't... Like, like the Pope? Like, like the monarch? Well, not quite. Maybe. Well, here's why. Well, I'll tell you why. Point. So whatever he feels good about. But what, why I say that is this. He every day is like creating. So it's like, I want to do this, and he's singing, and it doesn't matter who's there. He's making up songs just for me, for the kids. And so to have this avenue, this venue, this sort of place, outlet, outlet I love that for him. I don't know where that energy goes if this goes away, because this is the gig of a lifetime, if you like it. So he's in the perfect job for to him. To me, yes. Wear a teeny weeny beanie while I'm singing to Jolini. Teeny weeny beanie. And as long as he can help it, Jimmy Fallon's it Tonight Show beanie. will stay playful. I, I you promise. You don't swear. I You're a clean teen. I'm a gentleman. That's why I love you. Boop, I got boop. Funny. My derby hat was designed by Elon Musk. It's a drone. And sunny. And I don't even have to put it on. It just hovers over my head. It was tough doing the show, you know, after my mom passed. But what are you going to do? You have a job to do, and you'll hear a song or something, and you're like, ooh, I'm going to cry. But, you know, you can't because I don't think you want to see the, the host get upset. I'm curious why you thought that you shouldn't get weepy, because as a host, aren't you kind of no. a little bit like the, the proxy for the audience? No, I, I, yeah. you know, I, I, those, those are the moments of the show I really I don't like. I just really want to just be the outlet of joy.
This should be an hour where you don't have to think and you go, look at this idiot. He's doing something ridiculous. And then he falls asleep. That would be my best reaction from any of my fans. You'd be like, thank you. Thank you for being silly so that you can make me not think about my problems. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Jimmy Fallon's chat. You can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. As promised, here's more from Mo Rocca's conversation with Jimmy Fallon. Are there any sort of like kind of patterns or big things you've noticed, like over all these hundreds, thousands of interviews or interfacing, meeting and re-meeting, you know, big public figures, like certain things you've noticed, I don't know, about talented people or about people in the spotlight, things that... The bigger the star, the nicer the person, I would say. Really? I think so. I feel like the professional, the one you're like, oh my gosh, you had Bono, what was you two like? And they go, they were unbelievable, professional, on time, polite, charming, did all the bit, they do all that stuff. And I feel like those, those big stars have learned those lessons of probably, you know, when you're kind of young, you kind of like, you don't even realize you're doing stuff, probably, I think. But you learn those lessons, I think the, the more success you get and you go like, you get knocked down a couple of times and then you get back up and you go, okay, this is how you really do it. So every big star, everyone's been nice to me. I'm a very, you know, a very positive show, but I think the biggest stars in our show are the nicest to me, uh, the nicest to everyone. I, but I've found that, I don't know why, but I feel like uh, very professional. And that's part of what's kept them on top? I, I, there must be something to that, I think. Uh, but it is, uh, that's a common denominator I, I see with a lot of our, you know, uh, a lot of the biggest stars. So it's just probably a hard question for you to answer, but or not. Um, the hosts that come after you, I mean, wow. why is it that? Wow. Why do you I didn't think, think we were going to get that. <laughs> It's Sunday morning. I know. No, it's Sunday morning. You, you want to hear the horn. You want to be happy. You're in a Zen moment. You're talking about my afterlife. Well, I, it, 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 when you're when you're happily in retirement, oh, so I mean, I'm still it's, alive. Yeah, you're still you're definitely in this scenario. You're still yeah, alive. Describe my death. Please. You're still you're you're absolutely alive, and you're you're really enjoying. You and Nancy are, you know, it could be like a yeah. Cialis commercial. The setting. In terms <laughs> yeah, we're of holding like, hands in separate bathtubs. Yeah, in separate bathtubs. Understood. But but there is something. I mean, it's it's. People have talked about it. It's conspicuous that the, almost all the hosts are guys in suits and ties, almost all of them white. Um, I mean, it's kind of like the Dead Poet Society or something. <laughs> anyway, it's so like, but why? But uh, I mean, is. why do you think that is? What would you like to see come next? I mean, I think it's just open. It's a big world. There's so much uh, stuff, there's so much space still left to be filled. I mean, there's room yeah. for uh, anyone. That, that wants to do it, you know? But I, I think that's the thing, you gotta really wanna do it. It's, a, it's more work than you think, uh, but when you do it, you go, oh yeah, this is a lot of work. It's every single day, you gotta show up and you gotta put on a happy face and you gotta do your job. But it's like, if you want this, you can do it. I think anyone can do it. I think uh, women, men, anyone, AI robots. <laughs> I mean, it's probably, that's, my successor is probably going to be an AI robot. Who knows what it's going to be? That's who's going to follow you. That is probably who's going to follow you. So Nancy and I will be watching some robot. Right. Uh, talk about, you know, how great I was or bad I was. How I laughed too hard. <laughs> the robot is going to be making fun of me. And I'd be like, I can't stand this robot. I was much better than that robot. And how long do you want to do this for? You tell me, but when am I going to die? <laughs> I'm not an actuary, but like I... <laughs> Uh, I think I want to do it until uh, everyone's like we had enough. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I, I'm happy. I, I, I'm interested in people still and, and interested in the show and I work hard to do the best show I could possibly do. I'm still interested in it. And so hopefully you can feel that if you're watching the show, you know, and, but once the audience is like, uh, we're ready for something different, uh, then I, I get it and I know when to get off the stage. And what would you even do without it? Be an audience member. Just go. <laughs> and watch and root for this AI robot who's hosting The Tonight Show. I go, isn't he great? Isn't he made out of the best wires and micro or whatever? Up next, the enduring charm of Charles Schultz. Welcome back. 
when the first Peanuts comic strip ran more than 70 years ago. Author Charles Schultz couldn't have imagined just how popular Charlie Brown and his pals would become. The Charles Schultz Museum celebrates the life and legacy of their creator. Here's Lee Cowan. Relax here a while, Charlie Brown. We'll solve this problem together. Some people use a diary to pen their innermost thoughts. Charles Schultz, though, he had peanuts instead. There's no better emotional outlet than kicking a football. It was a release for his emotions. This time I'm really going to kick it. I'm going to kick the habit. This is the end of all my faults. Ugh! He drew because he had to do it. Gee, I got a candy bar. Boy, I got three cookies. Hey, I got a package of gum. I got a rock. Was he a happy person? Um, I think he was. His widow, Jean Schultz, paused. Well, because it's a complicated question. She married him back in 1973, but she says it wasn't until after his death. Really, all you need is about four or five pens and a pencil. That she realized the simple lines of those oh-so-familiar characters were actually quite complex. I've spent the last 22 years doing my penance, and my penance is <laughs> learning how hard he worked. Was he a workaholic, you think? He pretty much was, yeah. Schultz created a world unlike anything we'd seen in the funny pages. Peanuts wasn't so much a comic strip as it was a mirror, a tale of adult angst told through children who never aged, and a dog who imagined he could be anything. Peanuts first appeared in 1950 in only seven newspapers. It may not be art with a capital A, but it provides an awful lot of pleasure. By the 60s, the gang was on the cover of Time magazine. Apollo astronauts even named their spaceships after them. Charlie Brown, Houston, over. Schultz had knocked it out of the park. I got a hit! I got a hit! I finally got a hit! I mean, think of the comics before that. They were all slapstick. People getting hit over the head or pies. This was something saying, hey, I'm not happy. I wonder if you're not happy. I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling anxious. I'm heartbroken. Peanuts had all of that. Stefan Pastis is the mind behind the popular syndicated comic Pearls Before Swine. This is Rat. Rat is kind of the star of the strip, along with Pig. Pastis was an attorney who so wanted to follow in Charles Schultz's pen strokes that he tracked him down here. So this is it, huh? Yep, this is it. At the Warm Puppy Cafe in Santa Rosa, California, where Schultz spent every morning having coffee and an English muffin. And I knelt on one knee by the side of the table, <laughs> and in the worst opening line of all time, I said, um, Mr. Schultz, uh, my name is Stefan Pastis, and I'm an attorney. <laughs> and he turned white, because he thought he was getting served with a subpoena. <laughs> that moment turned into an hour of encouragement. Sparky uh, drew this for me. Pasta what says it was the kindness that Sparky, clear, as his friends called Schultz, shared with others, house, too. If you did a cartooning tree, you would see we all come from that common trunk, and that trunk is Sparky. How many people do you think he influenced? All of them. You think? <laughs> yeah. This is from 1958, and here we see Snoopy on top of the doghouse. Benjamin L. Clark is the curator of the Charles M. Schultz Museum and co-author of a book celebrating the centennial of Schultz's birth with a look through 100 artifacts, like the Peabody Award that Schultz won for this. A Charlie Brown Christmas first aired right here on CBS back in 1965. Schultz had carefully curated the look of his characters, but now he had to figure out how they sounded, and he insisted they be voiced by real children. And he said, no, let's get some real kids in here. And wow. it'll sound like kids. <laughs> like, okay, Sparky. <laughs> Schultz always went to bat for the good of his characters. One, especially. Hey, guess you just walked in over here. It's Franklin. Franklin first appeared in print in 1968, at a time when some states were still fighting desegregation. When he showed Franklin in class with Peppermint Patty and some of the other kids, that's when the real pushback came. Newspapers threatened to drop him. But he didn't back down. He did not back down, not one bit. You print it the way I draw it. 
Over the course of 50 years, Schultz lovingly crafted nearly 18,000 peanut strips. So many, in fact, he nearly wore a hole clean through his drafting table. How does that happen? I mean, I don't know. God, to think of all the strips that came off that, mm -hmm. man. The very last strip Charles Schultz ever drew may have been the only one that made his fans cry. It was a formal goodbye, filled with gratitude. And then he left us too. He dies as that last strip is on the presses. He dies in the middle of the night. It's so poetic and crazy, almost as though there wouldn't be a hymn without the strip. His table at the Warm Puppy Cafe sits empty now, forever reserved for the man who somehow distilled all our fears and foibles and frustrations into a group of kids and one beloved beagle. He said, if you can draw something that strikes people and means something to them, that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.